with the case of Aaron, you see that, you know, they poured oil upon uh, him and so set him apart. The word we use in the, or you find in the New Testament, the word sanctification, it means to separate to a holy purpose. We're called the saints of God. It's the same word. We are people that are set apart for the Lord's purpose. And so God does not expect us to just do whatever he calls us to do on our own, with our own strength, by our own power. He's given us what, everything that we need in this life. Amen? But it takes faith on our part to touch that in him, to trust for that in him that we need. I want you to go back now to, to the Psalm, 133rd Psalm. And uh, just got a simple little sermon really this morning. I, we're gonna have a church picnic here and so we're gonna be hanging out together today and spending time together. And I want you to see how important that is from God's standpoint, from God's viewpoint. Really, one of the main themes of, of my ministry, what I believe that God has called me to, to preach, especially in a local church setting, I believe that God uses me in the local area, and sometimes he uses me in translocal way to speak to other churches and other places and other, uh, other believers and even ministers in other places. One of the themes that God has really put on my heart since I was uh, a young Christian is that, you know, the body of Christ is so important. What we're doing here today is not just gathering for the Lord. And I almost don't even want to talk about it. I, I get to the place where I don't want to talk about it because I find that it's hard for people to even understand what we're talking about. You may say, well, it's not hard for me to understand, Pastor Rocky. It's a really simple concept. And you're right. It is. It's a simple concept. But sometimes because we hear something over and over and over and over and over, but we really don't engage in doing that which we hear, our heart can tend rather, to get more, rather than getting more soft towards the subject to get harder towards the subject. So sometimes when I approach this subject, and you know if you come to this church that I do it a lot. I talk about, man, the importance of being the body. But sometimes I'm very hesitant because I don't want to harden us any further than we already are. Are you here? I want you to know, man, the body of Christ is important. These people in Matthew 14 and Luke 6 did everything they could do to get to the physical body of Christ to touch him because they knew that there was something called an anointing that proceeded from him. They may not have known much about what the anointing was. They may have only understood it in the frame of reference that, you know, I shared with you that it was, you know, something that happened to the high priest or to one of the priests. It was oil poured over them. They may not have understood all the, the you know, the symbology behind it, but they knew that when Jesus came by, there was something on his life that if they touched, they would receive a blessing from. That's how important the body of Christ is. That's a picture. Today, Jesus is no longer with us in physical form. Although he is in heaven, he does have a, a spiritual body. He's no longer, though, walking the earth in the way that he once did, but you and I are. We are the body of Christ. We are the extension of him. If Jesus is going to say something today, most of the time, he's going to use one of us to say it. If Jesus is going to do something today, most of the time he's going to use one or some of us to do it. We are literally his hands and his feet and all the other members of a physical body. That's the picture. We are those things. We're the adrenaline gland. Are you here? We're, we're, we're the emotions, you know, I mean, he, he's the head, he's the mind, but we're, we're where the emotions flow to. If God's excited about something, then it's seen in his body. If there's a stirring of God in heavenly places, where is that seen? It's seen in the people of God most of the time. Can you think with me for a moment how ridiculous it would have been if you were alive during Jesus' lifetime? And let's say you were a, 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 you know, a member of this land of Gennesaret where they went over on the other side of the Sea of Galilee from Jesus' um, town of Capernaum where he ministered from. Could you imagine if Jesus was over in your land and they sent out the, the message, the decree, Jesus is here, man. Bring all the sick people. Bring anybody who's vexed of devils, anybody that needs to be delivered, anybody that needs anything, come and see Jesus. Could you imagine being somebody like so many of us today that says, well, you know, Jesus will be back some other time. I don't really need to go down there and touch his body. I could just talk to God myself. I'm just going to stay over here in my neighborhood. And, you know, Jesus is 
going to do what he's doing and I'm thankful that he's here, but I'm not going to really make any motion to be involved in what he's involved in. That's about as ridiculous as it is for us to not understand how important the body of Christ is. Not understand that man, God has assembled us for a great purpose and a great reason. The same anointing that's on Jesus is on us. Now the Bible says this about Jesus anointing. It says that he had the spirit without measure. And the Bible indicates in other places that you and I each have a measure of faith. Are you here? So there's a distinction between us and Jesus. Jesus was truly God in an explosive ultimate form walking on the earth. No one of us is that way. We're, we're not the full expression of Jesus, but together we're more than we are apart. Even just those of us that come to this church, if we could get together and see ourselves as the body of Christ, we would begin to experience a greater anointing. The more faith that we put and take our individual measure of our ability to believe God and put that together and throw it in the hat together and work together and walk together, even as, even as God called the children of Israel to do, the more anointing we're, we're going to discover and that we're going to experience. But I don't know, you know, sometimes it gets, all, it gets, I just get tired of preaching it, you know, it's just like it's a whole hum message. I mean, how many really ultimately anointed men or women of God exist today? Let's be honest. We have to go back and read about all the revivals, don't we? To really, really get excited. And it doesn't mean that nobody's, on. we all have an anointing, but the anointing, that's what the enemy's done. The anointing is so diffused in the earth today. The church is so separate in the earth today that we run around following a lollipop when we could have a steak dinner. When we search out somebody with just a small measure of anointing, but when we together can come together at any time and experience the anointing of Jesus. And you know, it's going to cost us something. It's going to cost us on a personal level. Nobody may ever know who you are. You may not ever get any credit. It may not be as exciting as it would be, you know, to, to uh, you know, for you personally to experience an anointing that someone else has on their life to be a part of the body. But it might be, might be the greatest thing that ever happened to you. Am I making sense to anybody this morning? This is the importance of the body. And one day before Jesus comes, I believe that the body of believers on this earth will rise up and will be seen in the fullness in a greater way than they were even in the book of Acts, in Acts starting in Acts chapter 2. We're not seeing what I'm describing to you in a large measure today, but I'll tell you what, that's no reason for us not to dream about it. How many people have ever played golf? We were talking yesterday, we had a bit of a staff meeting. We were talking about, you know, how to be a better church, how to be better leaders, how to get ahead of, uh, of our church so that our church can be the best church that it can be. How to serve the people in a way that God wants us to serve them, how to bring God to them. And during that time, I talked to him about a, a pre-shot routine, something called a pre-shot routine in golf. Anytime there's a big tournament that's being played right now, the PGA tournament, so... You might be able to, you know, after the church picnic to catch a little bit of Tiger Woods or something like that. And you might be able to get a little bit of a picture of what I'm describing to you right now. But in golf, there's this thing called a pre-shot routine. And you'll notice when a golfer goes, steps up to the tee to address the ball, he doesn't just step up, plant his feet, swing, and hope for the best. No, he goes up to the ball, decides, looks at the tee box area, decides where he wants to put his ball because he has the parameters there. He can choose within a certain box, an area to put the ball. He looks downrange to see where's this ball need to go. He looks at all the different obstacles that are between him and where the ball is going to go to see how to approach hitting this ball. Plants the ball, take, usually takes a few swings, then usually steps back, gets behind the ball, and one more time looks ahead to see, okay, exactly what am I doing here? That's what I'm asking you to do today. I'm asking you to get a pre-shot routine for the second coming of Jesus. Ask yourself, you know, where are you planted? How are you addressing the call of God on your, on your life? How are you addressing the call of God on your church? What part do you play? How do you facilitate helping us reach Newtown for the gospel? How do you play a part in receiving that anointing from God so people can come and touch Jesus in a very real way? 
Not, not, just, not just in an ethereal way. You know, when this really comes home is when we have, when we suffer together or when we have troubles together. It's kind of like being in a foxhole. We, you know, everybody prays in a foxhole. <laughs> even, people, even people that don't believe often pray in a foxhole. And a lot of times when we have something oppose us and we can't get around it, and we can't just do business as usual and get through it, then we start to realize, man, we need each other. I really, you know, Sandro and Yvonette and their children, Jonathan and Rachel, are sitting here in the second row. Wave your hands, guys. I was going to bring them up, and I will bring them up here at some point. But they, they, uh, they've been friends of mine for over a year, and we met them. They had a church. Uh, they're from Brazil. They had a church in downtown Danbury just up until last month. And they believe that God has uh, spoken to them to, to close their church and to come and, and, and add themselves to our church to be a part of what we're doing so that we can work more effectively at reaching more people together. So I'm really excited about that. When I, when I see that, I get excited because I'm like, man, the body does exist. <laughs> Even though sometimes, I, I, you know, what I told you before is real. I'm like, wow, does anybody listen to this? Does anybody care? Does anybody want to know? When I see that, I'm like, wow, there are some people that want to know. There's some people that are willing to step out and say, God, we're going to put you to the test. We're going to extend our faith towards you. We're just going to give up what we're doing, and we're going to go join someone else where we think you've called us. And Lord, we don't have to be anybody or whatever, but we want you. We want what you want for our area. That could have just as easily been me doing the same thing. In fact, I, I was encouraging them as we went through the process. I said, I did the same thing you guys are doing at about the same age you guys are. And I remember real well that it wasn't easy to do. It's not easy to be a part of the body. Why is it so quiet? You would think, man, this is a glorious message, man. You are anointed. You're called. The only thing is you got to do it God's way. We're really good at going, I want to be anointed, but I want to do it my way. But we got to do it God's way. There is no other way today. We're running out of time today to do it other ways. Come on, man. We got to wake up. It's, it's time to say, God, your will, your way, as I prayed before. Whatever you want to do with me. I don't need to be famous on earth. I want to be famous in heaven with God. When I get to heaven, I want God to be like, hey, have you considered my servant Rocky? He made it. He did a few good things there on planet Earth. Man. Kept his eyes on the prize. Wasn't perfect, but kept coming back to Jesus. Kept coming back to the concept of what Jesus was doing. It was about Jesus. Perfect. That's where I want to be famous. Sometimes I have to remind myself. Sometimes I, I want to be a little bit more famous here. Is there anybody like me? Sometimes I want to be a little bit more ambitious here. Sometimes I would like to just have my own anointing here. Do my own thing here. Forget about this reality of this corporate thing that I don't know if you're like me, but when I read the book of Acts, I'm like, who doesn't want that? Who does not want Acts 2? Jesus did not say to Peter, Peter, you go and wait in prayer. I'm going to do something for you, and then you give it to everyone else. No, he said, you guys go wait. There were 120 people in the, what we call the upper room. Peter was one of them. God used Peter in a powerful way. Peter had a certain position in the body of Christ. I'm not saying that there aren't levels of things that we do with God and importance placed on those things. We know that there are. God uses something called the five-fold ministry or the ascension ministry gifts. He sends people to teach and to train the rest of the people in the body of Christ so that they can be used. So that, the, so that the body of Christ can be seen. 